Next speaker is um, Aura Clark from Washington State University. And I'm very happy to introduce her today as she was also my PhD advisor. So Aura, please take it away. I'm really happy to be here also. Let me uh, just see if I can't, does that look like it's in the right mode for you guys? Yes. Wonderful. Well, I really appreciate being here. I admit that this talk's probably going to be a bit different than the lovely talks I heard yesterday and today, but hopefully it will be a source of inspiration. Uh, and so this talk really comes from a DOE workshop that I organized last fall called At the Tipping Point, A Future of Fused Chemical and Data Science, where uh, we organize uh, myself, David Kramer from Michigan State, and Jim Goyano from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, organized uh, this workshop. And there were basically three panels, and we were in charge of three panels. And this was funded by the Chemical Sciences, Biosciences, or sorry, Chemical Sciences, Geosciences, and Biosciences Council. Uh, which uh, hosts these workshops and then the output of these workshops is a publication. And so the panel that I was in charge of was called the Shape of Data in Chemical Science. And we had a really lovely panel that spanned mathematicians to computational chemists, both in quantum chemistry as well as statistical mechanics and computer scientists. And so we were really trying to tackle the question of how the patterns and kind of interrelationships in data that are produced from the methods that a lot of you guys have been talking about uh, kind of are used to refine and formulate chemical theories and develop new predictive models. And so the question really is, and let me get my little laser pointer on, you know, how can we go from observed phenomena and real data to mathematical models that yield model data to chemical theories which provide insight? And the complexity uh, associated and challenges associated with that whole process really derive in a lot of chemical systems from many body correlations. And you know, this is really because uh, there are interactions between the particles that are being used within the simulation methodologies, whether it's electronic structure or statistical mechanics methods. And this causes uh, these correlation that can be uh, across different scales. So you can have local correlation to global correlations. This can cause correlations across multiple length scales where phenomena that maybe occur on the ultra fast time scale propagate themselves into really long time scales. And so this presents a huge challenge for uh, trying to kind of use chemical data to inform and advance uh, theories that then get implemented in software algorithms. And so, you know, I would say that the computational chemistry community has become an expert in simplifying and removing many of the effects of many body correlation. And, you know, oftentimes we kind of take systematic approximations that only include a few sets or different types of interactions at a time, you know, through mean field approximations or perturbation theory. And there was this lovely talk, this very famous talk, obviously, by Richard Feynman that was called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom from 1959, where he basically sought to remove many body correlation at all by kind of taking the ultimate approach towards mini miniaturization and just considering the roles of individual atoms at a time, right? But there's a lot of consequences associated with kind of the level of approximation that we make within many body theories. And ultimately this limits the kind of predictive capability we can have for lots of systems. I think electron correlation effects are probably the most well-known for this audience. Um, for example, strong electron correlation makes it very challenging to determine phase diagrams of systems like plutonium. Or if you're interested in magnetic states and quantum phase transitions in nano or quantum materials or excited states in large photosystems, I think all of you guys can probably envision examples uh, where strong electron correlation really limits uh, the kinds of predictive capabilities we have. But these many body effects can influence things all the way to the meso and macro scale. And so this can occur, for example, in spatial correlations of molecules and colloids and how we predict the behavior of non-Newtonian fluids, or how you might envision coarse graining many body effects as you go from a molecular system like an amphiphile to a micelles that then form emulsions, and then you're interested in emulsion phase transitions. And so this led us within the course of this workshop uh, to a paper that was published this year in ACS Central Science. And this is kind of my, my plug for this paper in the sense that we're gonna talk about the content of it in hopes that um, it will be inspiration for some of the applications and methods that you guys are all developing uh, to extend uh, many body uh, theories to more to larger systems uh, and in more uh, computationally efficient ways. 
And so, like I said, the goal is to take all of the traditional approaches we take for many body theories and electronic structure theory and move it into things like condensed matter, where we have to propagate kind of states and time and to be able to account self-consistently for many body effects, where maybe you're trying to do this with different granularities of information. And so there were, there were three major sections of the paper. I'm gonna spend the most on section two, just because that was the one that's kind of more reflective of my own research. Uh, but I'll briefly go over the other two. And so the first is when small is big, which deals a little bit with electronic structure theories, the architecture of space, which I'll delve in a lot, and then coarse graining of time. And so with respect to this first uh, section, like I said before, uh, you know, when we talk about um, any body effects and electronic structure methodologies, really you have kind of two things that are, are highly operative. One is the curse of dimensionality in the system in the, in the sense that, you know, the exact wave function becomes tremendously complex as, as you go to system, large system sizes. And, uh, but there are these mathematically rigorous hierarchies that we all know about associated with how we can approximate many body electron correlation. And, you know, there were so many talks yesterday and today about efficient algorithms that it might enable us to tackle larger and larger wave functions. Um, and so when we think maybe about coarse graining that, right, there are also obviously a lot of electronic structure methods that have incorporated coarse graining into this process, thinking, for example, about a bottoms up type approach for coarse graining, where maybe we take something like knowledge about the exact wave function uh, at a very high level of detail and then create an effective model <laughs> that then gets coarse grained further into how that effective model can be expanded into multiple effective models until we understand something that is, uh, that is interacting at a much coarse grained level of complexity. And in fact, DFT might be thought of something like this, right? Where you're taking and you're kind of empirically building these unknown functionals by fitting them to exact properties. Um, but as we heard about so much yesterday and today, right? Scaling is still a really big problem. And uh, so much of what I heard about yesterday and today have been talk discussions about how we try to scale things linearly with system size, right? And obviously you can do this with divide and conquer strategies where you're course creating the Hamiltonian there's better linear algebra, there's better software design. All of this has been highly emphasized. Um, uh, I will just mention a couple examples, right, uh, about how you might think about using data science methods actually within this process. We heard a little bit about graph theory approaches and software design yesterday from Ed's talk, uh, but people can also use graph theory machine learning approaches for trying to kind of understand and develop linear scaling electronic structure by taking equivalencies in maybe how you deal with sparse matrix polynomials and graph partitioning. And this was done a few years ago by Anders Nicholson. Um, but basically, you know, recognizing that you can um, kind of take, if it, within the context of DFT, you can kind of write a Fermi operator expansion as a matrix polynomial, and then use the fact that graph partitioning is basically taking the characteristic polynomial of the adjacency matrix uh, of, that, of that polynomial and rewriting it in the context of, of partitioned subgraph polynomials. But there are lots of other examples, right, associated with things like neural, neural network methods, whether it's automated force field generation or accelerated sampling or parameterization, uh, improved density functionals, uh, tackling things like ill-conditioned inverse problems. There's many, many, many examples, right? And so the question then is, is, okay, well, so we've got kind of a basis, right, in the context of electronic structure theories and ways in which data science and applied mathematics methods are uh, ex expanding kind of the scale at which we can do electronic structure calculations. And so what are the new opportunities, right? And you can imagine this is kind of a, a map where we start off with, you know, information about the exact Hamiltonian and we want to go across this huge gorge associated with calculating the many body wave function to the finish line of uh, or our goal of achieving physical properties and observables. And there are lots and lots of ways in which we can incorporate data science methods um, to uh, try to traverse this boundary, uh, whether it's in the realm of machine learning, data dimensionality reduction, things like this. And so um, some of the new opportunities for data science and machine learning that we proposed in the incorporation of trying to tackle some of these many body types of, uh, of, of effects are, you know, how can we connect high level quantum chemistry with effective single particle treatments? Um, in which case you might consider, for example, you know, what kinds of optimization tools could we use uh, with data science machine learning, you know, what kind of data from electronic structure calculations will yield the best parameterization? 
what's the best way to represent data from electronic structure calculations? You know, how might you incorporate longer range interactions uh, without the huge amount of large computational cost? And doing this all in a way that does things like conserves constants of motion or symmetry of the system and maintains physical transparency. And so I think that, you know, part of our what are the part of the newness that we wanted to bring within this paper was to consider like, you know, we have this basis in, of, of, of techniques that we know how to do. How can we incorporate some new developments in data science and applied mathematics to kind of push these boundaries even further as it pertains to electronic structure and many body correlation. And so, you know, if in fact, uh, many of you and your goals for achieving really high scalability software for electronic structure calculations are able to actually make these breakthroughs, right? And do quantum simulations with hundreds of thousands of atoms over hundreds of nanoseconds, we actually have a huge problem, uh, which is how you analyze this huge amount of data to be able to understand and detect new features and relate atomic configurations and electronic structure of these very large ensembles you're gonna have. And maybe how you might imagine how that data could then be used uh, to develop new coarse grain models for larger and longer simulations. And obviously you wanna do this in the context of maintaining fundamental physics. And if you're going to use machine learning or other types of analyses, they can't replace um, kind of the science based on fundamentals, but, but we can kind of use our domain knowledge to try and do analysis uh, of, of the techniques that you guys, of the outputs of the simulation data that you guys are going to be, that your methods are going to be producing um, to help uh, learn new science and, and achieve new fundamental insight. And so this is kind of the second major section of this paper, which is the architecture of space. And this is the one I'm going to spend the most time on just because this is involves most of my own work. Um, and this is really kind of recognizing that many body correlations do propagate themselves to much higher levels of granularity than just electrons. And so we can consider the condensed matter systems where you know you've got maybe something like aqueous electrolytes or amplifiles that self-assemble liquid-liquid interfaces or structured fluids, like these non-Newtonian fluids that I was talking about. And as we kind of consider the change in organization and correlation across this scale, um, we can see that actually a lot of this correlation and many body effects are, are caused by intermolecular interactions that propagate themselves in this many body way. So you go from the scale of many body interactions at the scale of electrons to many body interactions at the scale of molecules or colloids. And so the net result of this is when you go to this much larger scale, you have very large ensembles of information, just like you might envision, you know, some highly correlated, um, you know, multi-determinant wave function as being a large ensemble of electron distribution. This is a large ensemble of different local environments and even higher order environments of molecules and particles. And so this makes it actually very, very hard to identify the many body correlations that are present in this data. Uh, and furthermore, um, just as in the case of electronic structure theory, that ensemble of distribution of local environments is related to the energy landscape of the system. Uh, and so, you know, we know that if we have very large populations of a certain type of environment, then it probably means it's representative of a relatively stable minima on an energy landscape. If you observe rare events, it's probably associated with higher barriers or higher minim energy minima on an energy landscape. And so the goal that we proposed within this paper is to try to develop encoding strategies that would allow us to pull out these many body correlations, going from kind of a connection between kind of molecular level information or particle level information to energy landscape topology. And so I'm going to spend a, few, a bit of time now kind of discussing some of the techniques that I think are really useful for analysis of this very large types of data sets. Uh, and so when we, if we just kind of first look at spatial correlations, uh, I'm going to give you an example of a phase transport phenomena where we have a solute. This is a, this is an oil water phase boundary. So this is the water phase and there's actually an organic phase here, kind of like your oil water vinaigrette maybe that's in your refrigerator and you know, you shake it up and solutes, they could be ions, they could be metal ligand complexes, go across this phase boundary. And when they go across this phase boundary and transfer from the aqueous phase to the organic phase, they form these architectures, which we call protrusions, that then uh, disassemble or, or disengage from the surface. And this leads to this phase transfer process, which is also known as extraction. So 
uh, in the context of analysis, so say you do some very large, relatively accurate simulation associated with this liquid surface, and you observe these structures by visual inspection, you need to have some kind of algorithm to really quantify these surface structures. And so expanding our capabilities to identify the organizational motifs and correlations with these organizational motifs is very important. Um, and so we've turned towards a wide variety of techniques, and I'm going to show kind of some of the correspondence between some of these methods. And so the first technique that I'm going to talk about is geometric measure theory, uh, or what's, uh, what we, what's also called the flat norm method. And this is actually a technology that comes from image denoising. And so you can imagine you've got some old photograph, maybe that's got a lot of fuzz on the top of it. And you imagine that fuzz as being kind of this surface structure on top of a perfectly flat, perfect image. And we want to remove this excess information from the from our base perfect image. And this is very similar to what you might think of as we have an ideal, an idealized, perfect, flat liquid liquid surf, liquid liquid interface. And on top of it, we have these organized surface structures. And we want to be able to pull those off of this flat basis and analyze them. And so to do this, we use the flat norm algorithm, which is basically a minimization uh, technique where maybe we have some function uh, in R2T and we wanna take off a controlled amount of area and find the smoothest line underneath that pulls off that area. Uh, and so we're minimizing uh, this, uh, the, the, the line associated with pulling off this delta S. And so in a more complex case, uh, we can change the amount of area that's that's taken off is changed by this term lambda. And so let's say we've now got a bit more of a complex function in R2. And at a very, at, and let's say we've got lambda equals lambda one, and this pulls off this, uh, this uh, brown kind of section and leaves the green underneath. And then let's say now we go for a much, much smaller lambda, lambda two, much smaller than lambda one, and it pulls off even more of this surface area and leaves this red line underneath. And so kind of the way you might envision this in a three-dimensional system from our simulation data is that we're going to discretize the surface into kind of a tetrahedral volume mesh. And when we do this, we see that we've got all of these very interesting shapes on our surface. And so a single lambda value taking off a fixed amount of it, uh, area or volume doesn't really work. Uh, and so we need to take a probability, uh, probabilistic approach where basically it's kind of like we're rolling a ball on the underside of our surface and we're changing the uh, radius of this ball so we can get into all the nooks and crannies and capture all of these surface elements. Um, and so we change our lambda to capture systematically more and more of these surface elements. And uh, we track those components that we take off uh, as we uh, change our lambda size through the flat norm algorithm. We monitor the volume of the components that we take off, and then we post some thresholds. For example, like you can't take off a volume that's less than the size of a molecule, for example. And so we have our, we, we go through and we're systematically decreasing our lambda and changing kind of the ratio of, of how much volume is taken off versus how much volume uh, is present in our molecules uh, or the surface structures. And we keep track of all of these components. And in fact, uh, you know, that, the idea is that if a, if a surface structure is a real uh, chemically relevant surface structure, it will survive a long time with these changing lambda values. And it's a much higher likelihood that it's going to be a surface structure that's relevant. And so we can rank them kind of probabilistically in this context. And we created a data set of about 150 by eye uh, kind of things that we called protrusions that looked like protrusions by eye. And we're able to compare this algorithm with our database of visual inspection. And we got pretty good results in the sense that, you know, we were able to, number one, we were able to, to identify all of these surface structures uh, with this algorithm. But as you got to kind of uh, uh, structures that had less and less probability, you started to get some false positives. And this occurred because um, you would have things where you'd have protrusions that might be embedded within kind of like a concave surface structure, uh, and, that, and it's harder to identify those. So we can compare and contrast this type of data analysis with something that's based upon graph partitioning, actually, where if instead we take that surface structure and make, we make a graph of intermolecular interactions of all the hydrogen bonding interactions that are on the surface, we can use something like modularity optimization to identify 
distinct hydrogen bonded clusters on the surface to see if, in fact, those hydrogen bonded clusters have distinct characteristics and might be associated with these protrusions. And so basically the idea behind modularity optimization is that you're trying to develop like all clustering algorithms, right? You're trying to identify a dense subcluster that has maximal interconnectivity within a cluster identification and minimal external connectivity. And, uh, and I'm, I'm not gonna go through the, the algorithm right here, but it's, but it's very effective at kind of optimizing and taking, you start off with every single node in the, in the graph is a different color or a different cluster. And then we systematically optimize Q to get a really nice final cluster optimization uh, where we've maximized internal connectivity and minimized external connectivity between clusters. And in fact, these two approaches are very complementary and effective uh, with respect to one another at the goal of kind of this, what I would call sub ensemble analysis of these surface structures that are present that are causing actually many body correlations, both inside the cluster as well as between clusters. And so now that we can analyze um, these clusters using these two different methods, we can say, okay, well, you know, what's the likelihood that a specific cluster architecture will lead to a specific type of reaction or transport process? Or if I've got one cluster or protrusion present at one point on my surface, what's the likelihood is going to impact another one? And so both of these techniques work relatively well. Uh, we had from visual inspection 3.53 protrusions per frame of our simulation data and modularity optimization caught 3.18 of them and flat norm got 2.6. But we can analyze hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of frames of data from our simulation to actually get really good statistics, even if we're not capturing exactly all of them. So now I want to turn to, you know, all of this analysis, kind of this higher scale many body kind of correlation analysis that's coming from these much larger simulations. Um, you know, I, I, I cast this initially as the, in the context of trying to capture spatial correlations. Um, and so now I want to tie this back up, you know, I, in, in a graph representation, you often lose some of the information associated with the Cartesian coordinates and spatial structure. And so a way to put that information back, back in is to use what are called distance filtered graph representations, uh, which is a type of computational or, or topological analysis called persistent homology. And so we can create distance filtered graphs where we start off with our carbon carbon positions, say, for example, and we grow these radii around um, around our uh, our atomic or per particle locations. And when these radii intersect, they create an edge in the graph. And then when those intersect, they'll create holes and simplicial complexes as we kind of glue together edges to form triangular faces. And we keep track of the number of components and whether or not we have holes or loops within our, in our graph using a persistence barcode. And so these blue lines are what are called the Betty zero numbers, which are the no total number of components that are present as we grow the radii associated with these, with these uh, spheres. And then the Betty one numbers are the number of loops or cycles that are present in the graph. And so it provides a very compact representation of this spatial information. And so we've used this actually as a technique to identify both spatial correlation as well as temporal correlation. And I'm gonna give you a quick example where we used uh, persistent homology uh, to uh, encode dynamics and fluctuations in shape. And so this was actually done, uh, we were analyzing from Tom Marklin's group some data that he gave us associated with path integral molecular dynamics, uh, where he was trying to understand uh, kind of the quantum mechanical nature of nuclei and nuclear deformation during things like proton transfer processes. And so we compared and looked at uh, a large amount of data, both from a Cobb Anderson forming glass that had highly localized atomic nuclei versus highly delocalized atomic nuclei, where there were very big changes to shape. And we compared kind of this persistent homology approach uh, and its ability to resolve this deformation in, in, in time and space uh, with something like the proton transfer of acids, where there's a much more subtle change to nuclear shape in the context of the quantum mechanical delocalization of this proton as it gets transferred. And in fact, so you, we wanted to basically ask the question, you know, can persistent homology quantify these shape differences? Can they capture fluctuations in shape in time? And so we used our persistent homology barcodes. And then we also introduce distance metrics uh, where we use the Wasserstein distance as a measure of the differences in barcode distributions between adjacent snapshots. And so we've got 
our quantum nuclei and the beads, all of the Cartesian coordinate information associated with the beads in this ring polymer. And we have a distinct persistent homology barcode for every single um, set of ringed beads uh, of every single nucleus. And we look at how that persistent homology barcode is different from one snapshot in time to the next snapshot in time with the idea that if in fact you've got more quantum nuclear delocalization, you probably also have more fluctuations and we can capture this by, by the Wasserstein distance metric by looking at how big that Wasserstein distance is when we go from one snapshot in time to the next. And so, in fact, if you plot the Wasserstein distance uh, between adjacent pairs in time of proton transferring versus non-proton transferring, in fact, you do get very large fluctuations in shape uh, that correspond to relatively large amounts of quantum delocalization. And so this implies that there's a dynamic component of quantum delocalization that people have not previously observed. And in fact, if you do a Fourier transform of this Wasserstein distance, you actually get characteristic time scales that's very well resolved for this shape fluctuation. And so I'm just going to end. Um, I've got I'm going a little bit over time, so I'll skip through this a little bit. But I'll say that persistent homology is a tool towards this dual encoding concept that I talked about before, where we want to encode not only structural and temporal information with also energetic information. And so you can do persistent homology um, uh, on surfaces as well as, as uh, in between point cloud data. And so the type of persistent homology you do on a surface is called sublevel set persistent homology. And so imagine you're, you've got something like a potential energy landscape and you're filling that landscape up like a bathtub with energy you keep track of the components, which are the minima. And then as you fill up, the minima merge because you're filling up this bathtub and you, you create a barcode representation that's unique for a potential energy landscape surface. And so I'm going to skip through a bunch of this information, but we were actually able to show very high levels of resolution and fidelity for encoding potential energy landscapes and looking at patterns in potential energy landscape and how they could be related to one another across a series of, of different molecules. So finally, I'll just end with the core screening of time. I've just got a couple slides here because this is kind of the final piece, right? We talked about how we can understand and encode information about electron correlation to maybe extend and develop new uh, electronic um, structure methods that might allow us to you know, do larger and larger simulations. We talked about how we could analyze those larger and larger simulations and capture many body effects at a larger scale. Now, the final scale is how do you get to really big systems and really big time, right? And it's very challenging because the spatial and temporal correlations that we talk about at this fine grain level impact coarse grading to longer length and time scales. But the descriptors at a fine scale might not be relevant to coarse grain scale, right? Uh, you can't coarse grain out the variables at a refined level into a really big level without losing information. Uh, and so there are a lot of challenges and opportunities for thinking about how we can develop new coarse grain models. Um, and, so, and so thinking about, for example, coarse grained equations of motion, right? Some of those challenges associated with this might be, you know, that you want to span time scales that go from femtoseconds to minutes or hours. That this heterogeneity and the time dependent behavior described by the techniques that I showed you, right, with persistent homology could influence long time scale simulations, but that the time step of those long time scale simulations are too long to incorporate that heterogeneity. You also have something that we call the inverse problem, right? How do you determine the statistics and dynamics of fine grained variables if you only know the dynamics of coarse grained variables? And so there's a lot of opportunities for developing techniques uh, that allow this coarse graining process using things like data science techniques, whether it's training AI models to find grain data or advancing data-driven reduction models to create coarse green dynamics. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, go to the paper to read more. There's a lot of information there, but I'm running out of time. And so I just, wanna, I just wanted to kind of throw some of these concepts out there because I think they're really relevant to thinking about software development beyond just electronic structure. And, and I wanted to promote this paper a little bit because I think there's some interesting ideas for people that are maybe more um, junior scientists kind of entering this, wanting to think about how to create some niche uh, sem chemistry and science of their own. And with that, I just want to sh share that there's a relevant workshop that's going to be happening at the end of February because uh, many of the issues that I talked about associated with kind of this middle science and these correlations are present in soft matter systems. 
And so with the support of the Institute for Mathematical and Statistical Innovation, we're holding this workshop that's really meant to bring together chemists and material scientists, mathematicians and computer scientists uh, on the mathematics of soft matter as it pertains to structure and dynamics. And we're gonna have some software training events and recruiting events for people that are interested in bringing in uh, students who have this really dual efficacy of chemistry and math and CS. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Laura. That was very interesting discussion. I want to mention, since I have been kind of following uh, your uh, projects, you have developed this thing to a code, right? It's something that people can take advantage of it. Yeah, so there's actually several codes um, associated with, um, with what I talked about. So a lot of the graph theory codes are present in our chem network software, which is actually currently being heavily revamped to have a Python wraparound. Uh, but then also the computational and persistent homology data exist as standalone codes and they're all available on our GitLab. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, we don't, we do, we do kind of a lot of what I would say, uh, practical brute force code development. And we're really excited about, you know, if people are interested in any of our codes and putting them into bigger platforms. Um, but, you know, we're really trying to kind of propose new ideas and then hopefully some other people are interested in taking them on uh, in other software platforms as well. That sounds great. So are there any questions or comments? I kind of took us a little long, sorry guys. Well, uh, our previous speaker also went slightly over, so oh, okay. That's okay. <laughs> Well, if you guys have any questions or discussions, please go ahead and discuss them in the chat. I think it's time to 